Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Inguahe IHG uh, discussion on the IHG Inguahe Talks. And uh, today we have an honor to um, have this discussion about the very important topic of, on the international standards and guidelines with uh, international uh, global ter uh, tertiary uh, education experts. Um, we are waiting for, while we are waiting for our colleagues to join, um, uh, we would like to um, here uh, make this a very interactive session, make it fun, as Francisco said. So please uh, be very active. Um, a, a couple of household um, uh, rules over here. Uh, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A Q &A, and the rest um, you can uh, handle through the chat. Uh, but the questions, please, please, please forward is in, in the QAS so, so that we don't lose them. Um, for um, um, this session will be recorded and um, please um, make sure that uh, you keep your microphones, um, yeah, you, you, you keep your, um, um, the speakers will be keeping the microphones off until, um, yeah, the, the turn comes to talk. So, um, yeah, uh, we are almost ready to start. A couple of more minutes and then we will launch the session. Yeah, I think we can start already. Well, um, thanks everybody for joining us and it's our pleasure and honor to have you with us and our honor to have the distinguished guests uh, to talk with us about the international standards and the guidelines that Inguahe developed and launched in uh, 2022. Uh, for this uh, panel, we are going to have a discussion with the globally uh, well-known experts in tertiary education, and it's my pleasure to present them here. We're going to have representation from, um, uh, uh, we're going to have representation from UNESCO ISALC, um, which is, and we all know that UNESCO is the only, uh, the, the only UN um, entity that has the mandate in higher education. So we're very happy to have Dr. Francesc Pedro with us. Uh, Francesc, do you want to give a couple of words of welcome to the audience? Uh, with, uh, with pleasure. Uh, greetings from Caracas, Venezuela. It is really a, a, a pleasure, uh, an honor, and I hope also that I'm going to be enjoying and laughing so from time to time uh, during this session. But really, thank you very much to Susana and Kwahe for counting on us. I really look forward to learning a lot from this session. Thank you very much, and back to you. Thanks, Francesco, uh, Francesc, and it's really on our honor. Thank you for being with us. I have here an um, honor to present to you um, uh, Dr. Jamil Salmi, who is, um, well, I don't think that we need to introduce him. It's, uh, it will be an understatement, but we're happy to have Jamil here and to hear his reflections um, on, on the international standards guidelines and the trends in higher education. Jamil, would you like to say a couple of words of welcome to our audience? Thank you very much, and uh, Susanna. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone, and it's a great honor to be here uh, with you today. Um, I like these days. I like to describe myself as the uh, student of higher education worldwide, as I'm still learning about new trends and developments. Thanks, Jamil. Indeed, we're all learning every day, every time, every hour, and lifelong learning is all with us. <laughs> Yeah. Next in my on 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 my on the panel, we have an, an honor to have Dr. Deborah Everhart, who who represents um, the one of the innovative solutions in the in the world of digital credentialing. Deb, you would you would like to say a couple of words about your yourself and the job you're doing? Yes. Thank you very much for including me. Um, credential engine work includes data infrastructure that can be useful for bringing all of these processes into a much more contemporary methodology. I have learned so much from this group already, and I frankly am quite humbled by seeing the 
the expertise from all around the world um, from people in the chat. So very happy to speak to you all today. Thanks, Deb, very much. And Deb was also part of the developments we had to bring in the insights from the industry, from the micro credentials, from how 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 it works on and the nitty gritties of the new uh, developments in the field. Uh, next uh, on the panel is um, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Esther Virtas, and she is head of quality assurance department in Acu Catalunya, who has been really very instrumental in developing some of the modules of IHGs, and she is representing a quality assurance body, like one of the key stakeholders in this in this whole discussion. Esther. Good morning, Susanna. Good evening to, to everyone. Thanks a lot for this initiative to Iguahi and thank you uh, so much for, for inviting us to, to participate in the elaboration of the international standards and guidelines, but also to be here with all of you. I'm very impressed uh, with the audience because there's a huge, uh, very big representation of different countries. So let's see. It's a very challenging. Thanks a lot. Back to you. Thanks a lot, Esther. And uh, also, I would like to introduce Francisco Marmaleo. I don't think that he needs an introduction again because he is so well known. Everybody, well, there hardly any higher education or tertiary education event without him. Francisco, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Susanna. There is not too much to add, but rather than uh, again, welcome everybody. And uh, thanks, uh, thanking uh, you for the kind invitation. And more important, inviting everybody to participate actively in today's session uh, with comments. And uh, but I hope that we can learn together today about this uh, key uh, subject. So again, thank you very much. And then um, I think we are ready for the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I can't agree with more uh, more with all of you that this is the session that also helps us to learn, learn from uh, from you, L learn from your uh, the richness of your expertise, from your experiences, from your practices. So we're all here, open to the for discussion. Put your questions in the Q Q and A and the chat and um, your reflections in the chat. We will be there. We'll, we're here with you and we will be handling them um, throughout the whole session. Now, uh, the setup of the session will be as uh, follows. Um, we, we have um, a, a slot to hear from Dr. Jamil Salme about the trends in higher education, in global tertiary education and how things are moving and what are the challenges out there. This morning he said, Susanna, do you want to make it rosy colors? I said, no, we, and he said, or objectively, we go objectively. So <laughs> we will be presenting it in objective views. And then um, afterwards, I will be presenting the um, the key challenges that were um, actually actually targeted when we were um, uh, developing the IHG. What what is it that we are resolving through the IHGs? And then um, uh, afterwards, we will have uh, Q and A questions and answers with the um, audience on different parts of the IOGs that we're developing and how this uh, will support us in facing the challenges of this ever-changing um, uh, higher education or tertiary education landscape. With this, I would like to give the floor to Jamil. Jamil, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Susanna. With the arrival of this new year, Jan uh, January is usually a month that we dedicate to celebration and optimism. But today at the beginning of 2023, I'm not sure how much there is to celebrate. Today I see our planet as not the happiest of places as we're facing serious crises in the health, social, economic, political, environmental and energy spheres. As we all know, we have had this terrible pandemic since January 2020. And uh, it's sadly ironic, I think, to observe that the country with the highest numbers of COVID-19 casualties is the US with more than 1.2 million deaths to date. The same nation that supposedly has the best universities in the world and the greatest number of Nobel Prize winners in medicine. And I think that in country after country, we have seen a total disconnect between the use of scientific evidence and actual health and public health policies. Whenever politics, 
get in the way of good policy. The second big issue is climate change and loss of biodiversity, as a, which I see as one of the biggest threats to the future of our planet and to our future as human beings. Um, despite repeated warnings, many studies, many nations and citizens continue to display business as usual attitudes and to rely on fossil fuel without limits. And then we see these crazy events, heat waves, colds, drought, forest fires, flooding. I mean, can you imagine a big country like Pakistan with a third of the population, and that means also a third of the schools and universities were underwater for many weeks. Avalanches, rising sea levels. And as a result, we see forced migrations, declining food production, water insecurity, endangered life-sustaining ecosystems, and increased social disparities. And third, with the persistence of war, in 2020, we registered 56 armed conflicts on our planet. Not to forget the criminal invasion of Ukraine by Russia in 2022. Our world has become less safe over the past decades. And finally, we are faced with increased income inequality and an overall decline in democracy. These are the external threats. But in addition, our world of higher education is also confronting major disruptions. And this is what we're going to be talking about. We've seen expansion, that's a great thing, but with enduring disparities. Sub-Saharan Africa has an enrollment rate at the tertiary level of only 10%. At the other extreme, we have countries with 70, 80%. And students from traditionally underrepresented groups in both rich and poor countries continue to suffer from less opportunities not only to access higher education, but also to graduate successfully. Second source of disruption is internationalization. Globalization, declining communication and transportation costs, and the opening of political borders, at least before the pandemic, have combined to facilitate an increased movement and flow of both students and academics and growing international collaborations. Furthermore, in designing their programs and courses, higher education institutions must increasingly take notice of the considerable transformation that the labor market is undergoing in the digital era as a result of the fourth industrial revolution. You know, last week was Davos, the World Economic Forum meeting, and these are some of the key aspects that they've been discussing. And this means that we have tremendous changes in the skill sets and the mix of qualifications needed to succeed in the new work landscape. And then we have advanced technologies that are available in countries and higher education institutions with access to reliable and fast broadband. But we also have a huge digital gap. Now, there are four positive developments that I would like to mention. The multiplication of online hybrid and flexible modes of delivery, including the MOOCs. The emergence of alternate forms of certification, including micro certificates. The growing use of open science, big data, and open education resources. And as a result, the rise of learning analytics that allow us to identify at risk students and design effective remedial support. Now, it remains to be seen whether the latest use of artificial intelligence in the form of Chat GPD and other AI assisted writing platforms is a blessing or a curse. But these technologies, whether we like it or not, they are here to stay, and we really must learn to leverage them as drivers of enhancement rather than thrust. As universities reflect on their role in supporting the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, they must incorporate four objectives 
beyond their traditional mission of providing high quality and relevant program. And these, to summarize them in one or two words, are equity, truth, ethics, and social commitment. And I'll finish by going very quickly through them. There is a need first to amplify efforts to increase equity and inclusion, especially in elite universities, often more preoccupied with their position in national and international rankings than to provide equal opportunities of access and success. Second, pursuing truth as a core objective of university's mission is all the more important today in a world of fake news, systemic disinformation, and conspiracy theories. Higher education institutions have a unique responsibility to teach how to distinguish real evidence from fabricated information and to apply knowledge to problem solving in every walk of life. Truth seeking skills to therefore be at the core of every curriculum. Third, university education must place a stronger emphasis on ethical values and behaviors to promote honesty, tolerance, and solidarity. And this goes beyond just having a compulsory course on ethical practice and conduct for everyone. Positive values should permeate all academic programs and be an integral part of the institutional culture of universities, aiming to prepare graduates who are not only excellent professionals, but also agents of social responsibility, champions of sustainability, and citizens longing for social justice. Last and not least, education institutions can and must contribute actively to building a more sustainable world through their education programs, research projects, and engagement with local, national, regional, and global communities. This is central to the development of the green and circular economy that is indispensable to mitigate the negative consequences of climate change. And research intensive universities in particular should find the right balance between pursuing blue sky research necessary for groundbreaking scientific advances and undertaking applied research driven by the need to solve real life problems and address the local and global challenges embodied in the 17th SDGs. How quality assurance must evolve to help us deal with these complex trends and issues is what today's webinar is about. And I'm convinced that Susanna and my colleagues will guide us in thinking through the potential benefits of the international standards and guidelines. Over to you, Susanna. Thanks a lot, Jamil. Very impressed about the, the key issues you highlighted about the instability of the globe, um, instability of um, our everyday life. We don't know what will happen tomorrow. And, and the importance of um, education in it and the comparatives you have brought the system, US system where the best education system is and yet most of, and the Nobel prizes and all of this. Um, well, this says something about the, the relevance. This says something about um, we, we must have erred at some point. The education systems globally must have erred at some point that uh, the, the core values of education, the relevance of education, the diversification and all of these matters that are there are not um, um, uh, bringing in um, you know these solutions that we would expect to to go towards the the, the peace towards the 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 safe and safe and secure environment to live in um i think that uh, these trends are uh, really uh, still um in the in advancement and they will still progress and all we can do is um a very um modest yet significant role that we can play through introducing the changes that we could do to handle those challenges but uh 
What Inquire has done recently is uh, to publish a new international standards and guidelines. And predominantly, if you could put the, the slide on the screen, predominantly what, um, what, what that was uh, compelled by is absolutely right with, um, and agree with your point. One model never fits it all. It has never done. I mean, it never did. But still, we used to have globally one or, or you know, um, regionally, or uh, we all were guided by one set of standards, one set of principles. Uh, we all learned from each other as quality assurance was, and that was normal because for the last 30 years, as quality assurance was massifying and evolving, establishing in diverse contexts, that was only normal, normal to learn from each other and to um, be guided by the same good practices, by the same um, developments in quality assurance. But we are here uh, with the fact of diversification, wide diversification at the institutional level, program level, uh, delivery, modalities of delivery. There is and higher education is no longer limited to higher education institutions. It's beyond. Higher learning includes formal, non-formal education, which is actively out there. It's just how do we recognize it? How do we make sure that it works for the benefit of the learner to increase the to, to make sure that it works for inclusiveness of the higher education, of the equity? Apart from the developments in the um, uh, higher education, we also have seen a huge development and diversification of quality insurance providers. The quality insurance providers um, have, uh, uh, well, moving from the um, core um, or the niche area they were operating in, like within the country, within the system, within the subject specific area, now they have expanded. They are moving beyond the cross uh, the, the borders and um, they, they are, there is a need also for to address the diversification the, um, uh, that comes from the uh, labor market, the, the, the higher learning that ha happens in the industry, higher learning that happens in the uh, outside the higher education um, environment, higher education institutions, uh, higher education institutions. We see uh, emergence of the uh, micro credentials, short learning programs coming from the industry, from non professional, um, um, non, non formal uh, providers. But still, we don't have quality assurance for that. With the quality assurance, um, uh, with the new standards and guidelines, we try to give the solution to some of these uh, big challenges out there. Uh, the second one, uh, the second issue was the relevance. Relevance is the key. As uh, Jamil rightly mentioned, uh, we see that, uh, well, there are uh, there is a lot of progress in higher education, but what is the link with the uh, actual core problems that we're trying to resolve? What is the relevance of higher education? So um, when, um, when, when uh, diffusing the policies and diffusing the quality assurance from uh, country context to country context, so there was a lot of learning that happened. Now we have come to the stage that the quality assurance bodies are mature enough to start developing the systems that are relevant to their own systems, linking the quality assurance standards to the systemic needs, to the systemic problems, so that it could be um, serving the purposes it was established for. Further, um, uh, Jamil mentioned about the, the core values. So if we look at the core values um, of higher education, and if you look at the standard, the, all we cherish, like uh, autonomy, academic freedom, independence, and then we look at the uh, quality assurance standards, it, it seems like we're not doing a good job there. Um, uh, not all of the quality assurance um, uh, policies and procedures out there were helping to promote the core values of higher education. Uh, core values influencing the 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 society, core values influencing the the shaping framing of the society, which is safe and secure and peaceful. Um, and uh, so there is an absolute essential for for success of higher education to promote those core values. What uh, we have done through IHGs is to incorporate those core values so that we could, through quality assurance, start promoting them, capitalizing on them, and giving them the uh, due role that they uh, need to play in higher education. Bia, uh, if you could click next. Uh, recognition, and uh, this is uh, one of the... A key element and the ultimate um, um, results that we want to have, our ultimate outcome of success of any system is it being recognized. What matters most is the student. 
our students, they get the qualification and what we want them, and, uh, what we are all working for. So those qualifications would be recognized within the jurisdictions and across the borders. So what we see now and witness now that not always this is the case. We are facing a problem of recognition even within the same country. Uh, if if the jurisdictional uh, regulations are not fit for purpose, are not comprehensive, are not uh, coherent enough, then um, we also feel uh, that the, the recognition issues, the recognition of qualifications is an issue in many settings, and it's especially so in the regional and global environment. And uh, we're happy here to have uh, Francisco Pedro with us, who will be discussing uh, how IHGs could be uh, help, uh, used to actually promote this. You would see that one of the core elements we introduced in the um, standards was the um, recognition of uh, recognition. This is one of the uh, core uh, standards introduced uh, to promote um, recognition um, of qualifications within the country, regionally and globally. And last but not least one, um, is the trust. Uh, we we hear a lot uh, about um, diminishing trust on quality assurance provisions, diminishing trust on higher education. More and more the governments are raising the issue of trust in quality assurance. And um, we see that uh, the core and one of the key elements to help this is the evaluation of evaluators. Well, this is a very popular in Europe and North American context. It's not so popular. It's not so um, uh, prevalent in other parts of the globe. And uh, the governments uh, more and more are stressing the, the need for um, instilling the trust in the quality assurance provisions and hence in the higher education institutions. This is what we tried to also um, um, do to make sure that um, our standards are promoting the um, the core values, uh, all these uh, key elements that are necessary for the success of higher education. With this brief introduction, I would like to uh, start the, the questions and answers. And the first question I would like to address to Francisc Pedro. Um, again, we go back to the recognition, and this is the core element. As we have said, um, all that matters now is to make the student happy. To make the student happy, there are a lot of factors that play uh, come into play, and one of them is uh, the usability, the applicability, the transferability of their qualifications, of the qualifications that we are granting. We are actually trying to um, uh, uh, provide for the students. Uh, Francesc, how can the IHGs, per you, uh, support the, the soft regulations that are out there, the regional conventions and the global recognition conventions that UNESCO has come up with? Well, thank you very much, Susanne. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm not 100% uh, sure that everyone, all participants in the audience, are really uh, knowledgeable about the global and regional conventions. So maybe I should set the scene and then mention, um, you know, how far you have gone in providing the necessary links between the standards and uh, the role that these conventions are meant to play. Now, let me start by saying that uh, we all realize that the COVID-19 COVID um, oh, will remain as, as really the, the largest educational disruption in history. I hope so. I hope that there is no other equivalent to this one or even larger. And certainly one of the areas that was mostly affected by it was uh, precisely um, mobility, all kinds of academic mobility. Now, we have seen uh, rebounds after the COVID-19, and this is kind of showing an appetite on the side, particularly of students, not only to go where they uh, wanted to go, before the pandemic, but also increasing the amount of students benefiting from some sorts of uh, mobility, including virtual mobility. Now, in um, our latest figures, um, we have calculated that uh, the number of mobile students has surpassed around 6 million worldwide. And we expect that before 2030, we are going to be already around 8 million. So, you know, this is placing recognition and mobility at the top of higher education policy agendas because higher education is becoming, uh, again, 
a global uh, uh, public good. Now, the global convention on the so-called recognition of qualifications concerning higher education was adopted by UNESCO's uh, general conference back in 2019. And I wouldn't say it's really soft regulation because for the countries that have ratified, we have already uh, 20 countries uh, ratifying the global convention and a number of them also ratifying at the same time the regional, the corresponding regional conventions. I think that for those countries that have already ratified the conventions, it is a document legally binding um, and certainly, uh, I mean, we have to celebrate also that it's the first United Nations treaty, so to say, on higher education with a global scope. Other than the Global Convention, we have uh, five uh, UNESCO regional conventions, including one uh, in the region where I'm sitting now, Latin America and the Caribbean, which has also entered into force. Um, uh, all of them are based on the same uh, principles. Basically, they create a framework for, um, I would say, fair, transparent, and non-discriminatory recognition of higher education qualifications. Now, maybe it would be good to <clears throat> reflect a bit more on what we would like to see as benefits of the global and the regional conventions, basically for students and countries, as well as, you know, globally. I think it is important to acknowledge that for the students, the global and the regional conventions uh, will mainly benefit those who are seeking the recognition of their own qualifications in another country or region for either accessing or continuing higher education or simply entering the labor market, which is really a, a very controversial issue. For example, it will become easier for students to have their high school diplomas, high school diplomas recognized in another region to pursue their post-secondary studies uh, there. It would also help we believe students who want to complete a degree in another country based on the studies they had started elsewhere, initially in their own uh, country. Now, this is for students. So it is going to be, um, I would say, a lever for having a, a quasi-automatic procedure for the recognition. Now, for countries that decide to be legally committed to the conventions, what we call uh, in the United Nations uh, jargon, states parties, the convention will be a strong instrument to prevent brain drain, since countries are going to be engaged in putting in place mechanisms to facilitate the recognition in their countries of qualifications obtained abroad. So now we are approaching certainly uh, the role that these standards that uh, you, are, you are launching now can play. In turn, the conventions will also facilitate the return home of academic diasporas uh, who have obtained their qualifications abroad. And the convention will also provide platforms for national authorities to collaborate across borders and regions to develop better tools and practices for the recognition of higher education qualifications. This is precisely, uh, you know, the role that uh, not only INQUI, but also these uh, standards are meant to play. Well, <clears throat> Uh, I would like also uh, to mention that with uh, physical mobility launching as a mark of privilege, to give you an example, in my own region in Latin America and the Caribbean, less than 1.3% of all higher education students are actually benefiting from some sort of mobility. Then, you know, inevitably we have to talk an, uh, about an elite benefiting from that. So now the global convention and the regional conventions also contribute to the diversification of mobile student and faculty and research uh, populations, um, you know, entering the, uh, uh, again, controversial domain of uh, uh, virtual mobility, as well as the emergence of various mobility pathways, including virtual mobility, making international mobility a more inclusive uh, concept and practice. Now, coming from UNESCO, I have to mention as well that the, the conventions are meant to help refugees and displaced persons, displaced persons access higher education and the labor market in their uh, host countries. Now, when it comes to the implementation, 
Well, um, we will uh, soon uh, start the work um, globally and, um, and, and regionally as well to make sure that we develop all the arsenal, so to say, to make sure that this convention translates into recommended practices. But now, the most important point, and this is again the link with the standards, is that the national authority, authorities are ultimately responsible for the legislation regulating uh, recognition. In many countries, ministries of education also play a role in the assessment and recognition of qualifications. In some other countries, like in, in some countries in Central America, this is uh, usually done by the most important public uh, university. Um, certainly, uh, you know, we have also a major player, uh, which is the National Information Center, and we hope also that the external um, uh, quality assurance providers will start playing a major role as well, because there is where we recognize uh, the most important expertise in really uh, not only assessing uh, quality, but also committing to quality uh, as an international um, um, engagement. And I would say that, you know, when your standards mention the importance of internationalization of or external relations, when you say that um, the external quality assurance provider should have a robust international strategy that leads to enhanced effectiveness and efficiency in, in its operations, or uh, when you say that it should effectively promote its collaboration with key players in national, regional, and international contexts, you also are making you know, a clear pathway towards cooperation in an area which is extremely controversial as it is the recognition of, uh, of, um, of uh, higher education qualifications. I would like to mention in, in just in finalizing that um, uh, we support entirely um, the uh, standards when, um, when they say that the external quality assurance providers should be open to international developments in quality assurance and tertiary education at large and should have mechanisms that enable them to learn about and analyze the main trends in the field, thus enhancing relevance, as Susanna has emphasized. You also said that the uh, providers should appropriately coordinate and communicate with other national, regional, uh, international government and non-government organizations in the oversight of its provisions. Okay, I think that the presence somehow of UNESCO in this panel is already in itself a declaration of our willingness to cooperate and contribute to enhancing the role that uh, quality assurance providers play in the recognitions of higher education qualifications and the learnings uh, that come along with them. Thank you very much. Back to you, Susanna. Thanks, Francesc. And Inguahe indeed is really a very much um, tuned to, 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 to stand together with UNESCO in promoting the recognition conventions, uh, both regional and international. Just for the information of the um, audience, uh, the regional conventions, they started in 1970s and they have been recently revised. Um, and the revised ver versions of the regional convention and the global convention, they already highlight the role of quality assurance as the key element in promoting the recognition. This has a huge implication for all quality assurance providers in revising their standards to make synergies to support this development and ultimately serve the purpose we are here for, recognition of the qualifications and making the students happy, making the, the education relevant. Now, uh, I would like to ask a question to uh, Francisco, um, um, just to contribute to this uh, with your reflections on this, um, you know, the, you know, regional and global convention and the role of IHGs. What do you think, Francisco? Well, I, I think, uh, Susanna, I think that the big challenge that all of us are facing is how do we connect the dots? So we have, on one way, the global, the regional, we have ISG. We have also, of course, the, the specific regulations that each of the quality assurance agencies have in our respective national or regional domains. Also, we have the regulations uh, or criteria that are being established by the accrediting agencies by itself, 
and also of course the internal sort of uh, sort of regulations and or criteria that each of the institutions had. So the big challenge for all of us in higher education is how do we make sense of all of that? How do we again connect the dots, uh, the dots, make coherent uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, uh, interactions between them? How do we use? And I think that's what I what I like to challenge our group and uh, and the audience today. How do we use each of them for the benefit, the overall benefit of improving the relevance of uh, higher education as it is translated into the transforming of the life of a, the very specific students we have in our higher education institutions? And again, I don't have the formula for that. There is no magic formula for that. But I think we, all of us in the community of higher education, and I, that's why I'm very pleased that we have this chance today to interact with the with people from the different organizations, I think it is uh, again it is up to us to be intentional about trying to find our own maze, if you want, our own uh, sort of uh, way to use each of them in order to leverage in terms of translating that into again better opportunities uh, for better education for the people that we are serving in our respective uh, domains at the institutional level. So, you know, I, I think a big challenge that we face as we discuss, you know, very high level uh, sort of regulations and criteria, as we tend to do working on our respective uh, organizations is that we tend to miss the point about the fact that what all of this is about. It is about having better ranked institutions. It is about having uh, more adequately positioned countries in terms of the global competition in higher education, and or it is about creating better conditions to provide more relevant um, education for the, uh, you know, the future citizens of our societies. Many of the challenges that Jamil was making the point about today on how complex is and will be higher education in the future and the context in which higher education operates and will operate in the future made necessary for us to go beyond the conventional, to use those great tools that have been developed, the global convention, the regional ones, and of course also the uh, ISG's um, sort of guidelines uh, provided by, by um, a uh, inquiry in order to make sure that we are translating that into the specifics of better and more relevant education. I think that is something that we should put as a key a sort of sign in our offices. Otherwise, we are going to get so lost into all these things and then forgetting what is the purpose of all of this. But in line and bridging the, the gaps, bridging the systems, bridging the diverse approaches, this is the core of the actually actual Nguahi operations, and it has been doing it for the last 30 plus years. And um, one of the benefits of these uh, standards is uh, just to um, uh, see how we are linking those dots, as you have said, and um, this is through establishing a common language for all of us to understand, to talk with each other. This, this is how the, this is the key role of Nguahi by sort of bridging the diverse systems at institutional, systemic, regional, and global level to make them, to, to have them understand each other. Because without speaking the same language, the common language, I don't think there will be any recognition. So this is the core that we are actually uh, promoting over here. Just um, Francisco, just, to address, uh, I'm just to um, uh, de to develop on the theme that we have been discussing. Let's go back to the core values of higher education, and we know that, um, and there are a couple of studies that clearly demonstrate that quality assurance has not been um, so far. We have not been very successful in promoting the core values in higher education. So, if we are not promoting this in higher education, so what is what are we there for as quality assurance? What we have tried to do with this revised version is to highlight the role of, of core values. Um, I would like to hear your reflections on how yeah. this could support. Well, you know, what, what I find extremely useful, and I hope that others uh, participating at uh, this session, and of course, already 
being uh, sort of mindful of, uh, of, uh, of the document is that it makes a very simple, uh, very concrete, you know, set of uh, points about what quality should be about in the organizations which are dedicated to enable and foster quality assurance uh, in higher education in whatever uh, regional or national uh, domain. You know, this set of six very concrete uh, elements there and of course, the specifics about some of the variations of the delivery of education that the world is experiencing, it's, it's something that I find extremely important. So simplicity matters a lot. I think that's a, a key element that I, find, uh, that I find on ISG. Now, on the other side, I think it is very important for all of us to have our own respective reflections in our respective domains about what are those values of higher education that we want to emphasize? And again, in which, in based on that, in which way we are, we can use those guidelines as, uh, and again, as a leverage opportunity. Uh, and many times uh, we know well that in the very concrete, specific context in which each of us are operating, there might be much more importance in some of values in comparison to other ones. You know, at the institutional level, we know that very well. There might be institutions in which Major emphasis is being made, let's say, for instance, in serving non-conventional uh, populations, if you want, of higher education. There might be other ones in which more emphasis is being placed on research at the expense of the delivery of education. There might be some uh, uh, operational, ask or operational context in which public service become, you know, becomes much more um, sort of a the the standard to follow of the other values in our higher education domains. So context matters a lot, of course. And I think what, what I find useful of, uh, of IEGs is that precisely provides this opportunity for institutions to use whatever they find useful, if you want, for the main purposes of their own um, a, a activity. Now, something that I like to, to, to mention just briefly is some of the concerns that I have when we talk about the definition of those standards. And I think it is very important for all of us to be mindful of. The standards are not, in my opinion, and it shouldn't be about sort of um, establishing a bar that everybody will have to sort of get into, and then now we are gonna be complacent about it. It should be not about assurance, but it's about improvement, enhancement, using that as a basis in order to go up rather than identifying those as the goal to achieve, and then we uh, sort of uh, rest, and then we do nothing. I think it should be seen as the beginning of, not as the end of. So that's basically my general point about it. Well, I can't agree more with you that enhancement is the core of all of this, and we are introducing the guidelines on the enhancement, which we'll be talking uh, close to the end of this session. But uh, I am really happy that you have raised this point of enhancement here. This is the core of our actions, and it's not. this is not a punishment mechanism that is coming there. It's more of an enhancement, making sure that it's, the things work the way they should and benefit the systems. And um, Jamil, um, well, when we were talking about the, the core values, and Francisco um, uh, rightly mentioned that they could be diverse, and we all understand that in diverse contexts, diverse values are there. But again, if we want to um, have a common understanding globally with each other, there should be some shared values as well for higher education. So um, we have seen that, um, uh, well, uh, the, the uh, literature review demonstrates that uh, at this point, there are some organizations that are trying to put the shared values, but in terms of having shared values globally for higher education, we're not yet there. So Jamil, what would be your reflection on the core values and how we could be promoting that? Thank you, Susanna. Well, I think there has been a lot of progress in terms of the what I think is called the I, DIE agenda, uh, especially in the US, uh, the diversity, inclusion, and equity agenda. And I see an increasing number of quality assurance agencies incorporating some criteria related to this agenda in their processes. Uh, we, for the UNESCO World Conference on Higher Education that took place in May in Barcelona, uh, together with uh, CHIA, the Council of Accreditation in the US, 
we did a survey of quality assurance agencies and it was very very encouraging to see uh, the, the large number of institutions that are paying attention to uh, this uh, dimension uh, but some of the other core values that i have uh, evoked in my introductory comments are still not part of the uh, agenda and i think that through the international standards and guidelines we can promote i, I just give one example which uh, struck me i uh, a few years uh, ago, it came to my attention that in uh, one of the best uh, Tunisian universities, a uh, physics uh, doctoral student was about to defend her dissertation demonstrating that uh, planet Earth is flat, uh, which and it's only because there was an upheaval because she had published an advanced uh, article in an Indian journal of uh, doubtful quality that uh, people started to focus on this and, and in the end uh, uh, the doctoral work was withdrawn but uh, we uh, we really need to look at this uh, how the standards can also accommodate the other dimension that i have mentioned uh, ethics um, truth and social commitment uh, we see that many business schools for example or law schools are starting to ask, ask ourselves themselves what are our graduates doing in terms of ethical behavior and i think it should be all education programs asking this question so um, i think it's good to put them on the agenda and to to work with uh, quality assurance agencies to see how in a diverse way because there is no one size fit all one answer but in the context where they operate how they could incorporate these elements. Thanks, Jamel, a lot, indeed. Um, now, I would like to, um, uh, well, one of our key stakeholders is the external quality assurance providers. And I would like to address uh, this question to Esther, who represents ACU Catalunya here. And um, uh, Francisco also raised in his um, uh, discussion about the, the diverse standards out there at institutional, regional, and, you know, the global level, how to make them all work. Now, uh, to respond to this question, I would like to also hear from um, quality assurance perspective, what is the added value for a quality assurance provider to undergo a review against the IHGs? And why would a quality assurance provider that already has a regional recognition be motivated to go for an international one? So, Esther, if you could just shed some light on that one. Thanks. Okay, yes. Thanks, uh, Susanna. And, and, well, very challenging questions. But I, I would begin saying that quality assurance is spreading rapidly uh, throughout the world and has quickly become professionalized. And as a proof of this situation is, is, is the increasing number of quality assurance providers around the globe, as for example, Linguehi includes around 350, 100 quality assurance provided, uh, providers approximately. But above all, the role of quality assurance uh, has become more and more relevant. And as I have, we have already heard from previous speakers, should support tertiary education systems. Uh, tertiary education is developing and facing new challenges. We, we have been talking about digital education, we've got micro-credentials, we've got the flexible learning pathways, the participation of industry in, in the tertiary education, etc. And obviously we, we should include what uh, the challenges that Dr. Jamil has already said, those elements may be included in the, on the agenda or be part of the activities of uh, tertiary, um, tertiary education institutions. And consequently, quality assurance must evolve accordingly. And we have to say that quality assurance is in, in constant development. When we focus on, on quality assurance providers, we can see that they may have addi additional or new tasks depending on the material adopting new roles or entering into new fields. This means that quality assurance providers have a constant state of reorganization as they add new tasks and respons responsibilities very quickly. And we should also, and I will link to, to the uh, first uh, speech of Yamil that we have to think about 
of these new challenges. ISG provides flexibility when talking about the diversity of quality assurance providers with different contexts, different legal frameworks, different cultural differences. So in a way, we are also uh, trying to make these dots, uh, the, the, this link in between dots, but that's at the same time establishes a minimum threshold of quality. This very line allows to have a common understanding, a common language on the quality assurance of providers, and most important, what, importantly, sorry, to build credibility, trust, and recognition of uh, quality assurance providers. The new features of ISD um, is how to, they tackle with a diversity of quality assurance providers from my point of view. The introduction of three standard modules related to cross-border quality assurance and quality assurance of cross-border education, quality assurance of shore learning programs and quality assurance of distance education is a good way to begin. Furthermore, it should be highlighted the, the spirit of enhancement behind the international standards and guidelines with introduction of this quality enhancement uh, continuum. So ISD combines the accountability role and introduces the enhancement dimension prominently, which is something very important too. In relation with the second question uh, that was related of uh, what would a quality assurance provider that already has a regional recognition be motivated to go for an international one, this is a very good question. As all of you can imagine, conducting an external review process is costly and time consuming. So quality assurance providers always have an internal debate on the added value of implementing the external quality assurance procedures. And the same debate can apply to also to, to um, higher education institutions. Well, this deliberation is even more intensive if a quality assurance provider wants to apply to additional procedures and normally uh, we are talking about international ones. There should exist always an analysis of pros and cons and the benefits for an international recognition are several. Recognition between quality assurance provider, uh, conducts review internationally, to hold the hallmark or to develop some competitivity competitivity advantage in uh, the competitive markets as some of the examples. But also I would like to, to add some additional ideas. The international experiences allows created uh, the creation of forum of dialogue, exchanging experiences, as for example, the expanding of uh, good practices, etc. In a way, this can contribute also to make progress on the quality of different uh, tertiary education system. On the other hand, quality assurance providers with a strong regional orientation may have some tension between domestic and international roles. Therefore, they should pay attention to, to the both roles. Uh, going back to the basic principles of the external evaluation, the international procedure provides trust in operations and prevent system for bogus providers and establish a common language of communication between diverse systems. To sum up, the quality assurance providers that already holds a regional recognition, the, ES, the ISD should be seen as a supplementary uh, procedure than, rather than an overlap, overlapping one. In any case, quality assurance providers should value the benefits of applying and maintaining different external quality assurance procedures at the same time. Back to you, Susanna. Thanks, Esther. Indeed, uh, regional um, uh, reviews have their own role. Regional standards have their own specific role and international are totally different dimension here uh, engaged. And, uh, and indeed, I agree with you that this, they are there to complement and supplement each, ra each other rather than to overlap, to create an overlap. And plus, um, the enhancement um, uh, logic behind the, the international standards and the guidelines is there for everybody else to be guided by when establishing and revising and uh, using um, uh, the standards in many ways to enhance their systems. 
I would like to hear uh, from Deb, um, from your perspective, uh, regional versus like in terms of the credential engines and, um, you know, and your organization and recognizing the, the engines, the, the, sorry, the degrees credential, uh, credentials that are there, digital credentials. What is the role um, uh, of regional and international accreditors in this regards when it comes to uh, promoting the recognition of credentials? Um, well, it's obvious that um, the problems that we need to solve together are global problems. And also, we know that we live in a global economy and that employers around the world need to be able to find talent to fill roles in their organizations from a much broader pool than they ever considered before, given the mobility of people and the ability for people to do work remotely. So we need to be thinking about all of our systems and processes in a global context. And how that affects individual people is that people deserve to have all of their learning count. So what is the most common now is that someone um, has some learning, some courses, some certification that is in a specific context or jurisdiction. And when they try to leave that context or that jurisdiction, they, they hit brick walls. They can't apply what they know and can do in another context. And so constant contextualization and recontextualization of what people have learned, what they know and can do, it's just absolutely necessary in, in facing these global problems. Well, that can sound very abstract, but quality assurance is a key part of that because if we don't have respected, trusted quality assurance processes, then that contextualization and recontextualization can be very haphazard, right? And so the way I see this work among different types of um, quality assurance processes and organizations um, is as a form of interoperability. And that's probably because I'm coming at this from a more technical perspective, but I think that word works more broadly also, because if we have quality assurance processes that are designed for certain jurisdictions or certain types of institutions and programs. And we have others that are designed for different modalities, such as online and for different types of credentials, such as um, micro-credentials and short learning programs. Um, then those different um, organizations and processes need to be able to exchange the quality assurance that they've done in their arena with exchange and link to that in others, right? And there are very effective technology ways of doing this. Um, there are, there've been a couple of mentions already in terms of common language. That's not just about having a glossary, that's about having a schema where we can actually have data structures that reflect the common ways of defining these quality processes that apply to different types of learning so that we can have um, information about these, about the quality of these learning programs that is both humanly readable and understandable and machine readable. So the interoperability is about the collaboration. It's about articulating the explanation as the ISGs do in terms of the relationships between different types of, of quality assurance. And it is also about how we can actually create tools and systems that make all of this work more effective. Thanks a lot, Deb. Uh, Bia, can I have the slide uh, on the standards? And, and it makes a lot of sense now to have a look after all this discussion, to have a look at the standards now and the, the key um, elements that we are proposing through the international standards and guidelines. Basically, uh, we all know that Inquahe has been um, offering its guidelines of good practices already for the last uh, 20 plus years. And um, this, the DGPs were the uh, flagship, um, one of the flagship activities of INGWAHI. And um, now they have been transformed into the international standards and guidelines with preservation of the core and the values that it has. 
Now, what we have done with the international standards and guidelines is um, to um, preserve whatever has been there and working uh, well uh, for us and um, making it, you know, um, more up to date. And also introducing a modular approach to the standards, which is a new way of um, uh, welcoming the diversified higher education and quality assurance. And um, you would see that in the first module, we have the baseline standards, which refers to all types of quality assurance providers, because they are basic common core that all quality assurance providers should be abiding by or should be following. But there are also specifics um, uh, just uh, related to specific field of operation, which not everybody could be engaged in, like cross-border education or cross-border higher education or cross-border quality assurance. Um, UNESCO and um, OECD came up with the guidelines on cross-border education. And um, the, these uh, guidelines, as we were discussing uh, during the World Higher Education Conference, uh, they were good, they were welcome, they were referred to, but when it comes to implementation, we needed further um, activities, further instruments to promote it. And through this module, we are actually promoting the cross-border education and um, the specific, we are concentrating on the uh, cross-border education and also adding on top of it cross-border quality assurance, which has never been discussed and has never been evaluated before. But the cross-border quality assurance has is becoming um, uh, more popular and many, many organizations are, many quality assurance providers are already starting and launching their activities across uh, their borders beyond their jurisdictions, which um, creates a lot of um, issues with the trust, with the credibility, and hence this module is for those ones, uh, is elective module and um, for those ones who are uh, actually uh, operating um, across the borders, both for higher education providers and quality assurance providers. The second module is the, um, the third module is on the short learning programs, which uh, we broadly termed as short learning programs uh, and micro credentials are also part of it. And they are addressing the, um, they are for the quality assurance providers who would be doing the review of the micro credential or the micro credential providers. Um, and those micro, we know that quality assurance of micro credentials um, exists only within the higher education institution setting. But when it comes to quality assurance and accreditation of micro credentials coming from um, industry, um, that has not been in place. And uh, uh, here we have the solution for that. And uh, another core module that we are introducing here is online and blended uh, online and blended provisions. Um, well, as we have discussed, and especially uh, enforced by a pandemic, we all moved um, online education or blended education has become one of the core modalities of education. But it seems like that um, uh, higher education providers or um, the providers of online learning, um, oh, they still need uh, some more enhancement in terms of uh, adjusting the per the requirements of the online education specifics. Um, just turning um, the face-to-face uh, -face, uh, format into the slides and presenting it online is, we all agree that it's not an online provision. There are so many nitty and critics we have to attend to. And this module is providing the setup for uh, attending to the matters related to online and blended provisions. And uh, last but not least, uh, uh, the quality enhancement continuum, which we see here, this is a fully new chapter that we are introducing in quality assurance, and that was driven by the maturity levels of the quality assurance providers. Um, as we have said um, uh, initially, um, the, at the beginning of this discussion, um, quality assurance has been establishing for the last 30 years, and it's the time already we move to the next level of enhancement of um, being more relevant and uh, in ga gaining the transformative power. And um, we, throughout the, the studies that underpinned development of those international standards and guidelines, we have found out that um, uh, when uh, quality assurance providers are undergoing external review, after the second and third round, they, they, these standards are becoming more irrelevant already for their operations, losing their relevance and benefits. So with this, we have tried to come up with the rubrics which help in uh, promoting efficiency, relevance, and transformative power of uh, uh, quality assurance providers so that with each cycle, 
the quality assurance provider gets to a new level, to a more enhanced level of operations and gets more benefits out of the standards. So basically, this is uh, what we have. Uh, we are introducing here. The quality enhancement continuum is a new chapter, as we have said, and that is why we're not calling them standards. They are just as guiding principles for us to be guided by, and they will be used as a summative um, reflections of the panel when they are reviewing the quality assurance providers to, uh, prov to um, ensure recommendations that um, benefit the systems on continuous basis. With this, I would like to uh, give the floor to Francisco Pedro to discuss with us um, uh, how uh, how he sees the ISG supporting the UNESCO OEC guidelines on cross-border higher education. And uh, to repeat what I have already said, Francisco, you remember during the World Higher Education Conference, we mentioned a couple of times that these are useful and they are relevant but when it comes to implementation, the nitty gritties of the mechanisms, they are yet to be put in place. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Susana. Yes, I couldn't agree more with you um, when it comes to these, uh, to these regulations. But first, let me say that uh, um, some time ago, I was surprised to, um, to see that in the standards, uh, you made explicit mention of this issue of uh, um, transnational uh, recognition and and, um, and 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 all it comes along. I think that it was really a discovery for me because um, during the pandemic, um, we experienced with many countries um, worldwide the need to, in a way, um, update the regulations about uh, virtual and and distance education. Many countries, um, you know, use the opportunity just to make sure that the regulations, um, the existing national regulations um, were more in line with the need to protect uh, students' interest and at the same time to raise the quality bar of what seemed to be like a second uh, hand uh, type of uh, higher education. Now, the paradox is that during the pandemic, Many countries also realized that they were, uh, in a way, um, 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 just putting more pressure on national providers of uh, distance higher education. And then they left to the free market, the uh, international provision without almost no regulations. So the paradox was, you know, that a, a particular citizen, um, you know, should see um, her uh, rights well protected if she decided to go for a national provider and then left, you know, to the to the white, so to say, in the event that um, that she decided to go for anyone anyone else anyone else uh, provision. So it was really a paradox, and this is why um, we at UNESCO are convinced that we need to revive. Uh, these uh, recommendations. Now, again, I think that this is really a uh, soft, uh, soft regulation because it's just a set of recommendations. And if you allow me, um, Susanna, I will express some criticism, if I can. <laughs> but no, no, I'm laughing because it's not really criticism. It's, it's simply that, um, you know, um, as optimistic as I was when I realized that this module was included, um, I was also, I experienced also a sad feeling when, when I saw that it was just optional. And certainly I can understand that not all um, providers, you know, have this um, connection with the uh, national um, government, so to say, because uh, we have countries where these um, external providers uh, certain quality assurance providers could belong to uh, private firms and, and are not really connected to uh, government priorities. Uh, but nevertheless, for the countries where national agencies for quality assurance in higher education exist, I think that this module should be mandatory. Okay, because I cannot imagine how can we uh, persist in just denying the fact that uh, higher education um, not only in, in physical terms, but also virtually, has become, uh, you know, a, a global um, a global asset, and uh, and also a matter for once again the protection of the rights of the end user. In this case, well, the direct in, uh, end user is the student or the participant, as you name it, 
but certainly in the end um, the, the beneficiary is the entire national economy or society so we need to really move ahead in that respect and i think that just as a reminder um the um the recommendations were um, designed um, through a quite a long process very iterative um and uh, were finished in 2005 and although it sounds that it's not so far i think that 2023 may, <laughs> may precisely after the COVID, may um, require a revision of those recommendations, particularly when it comes to the role that national, if you allow me to use this, uh, or if public um, um, external quality assurance providers should play when it comes to that. I think that the role that the standards can play is precisely helping uh, not only us uh, at international organizations, but also national governments and, of course, uh, national agencies, I mean public agencies, uh, to really align the efforts in what would be a very uh, desirable, I think, convergence of uh, criteria uh, based on the assumption that if I really trust a national quality assurance agency in another country, and that National Quality Assurance uh, Agency um, trusts a particular program or offer, then based on mutual trust, I would recognize that offering, okay? I think that this can really, really operate very well if thanks to the efforts like the one you have been leading, uh, really help us not only uh, um, to have the technical tools, but also to generate the trust uh, atmosphere, the right environment, you know, for creating that kind of interchangeable, so to say, uh, uh, experiences, which I think it is the only way ahead. On the other hand, I mean, the more we go, and I think that you are going to ask questions later on this, the more we go into the uh, fascinating domain of micro-credentials, the more we will be discovering that we have to deal also with uh, uh, commercial providers, which represent a new challenge. But I leave that, <laughs> Susanna, for the continuation. Of, so sorry for being uh, for having shared this criticism, because we at UNESCO see this as important as uh, to request really this model to be mandatory, at least for national agencies. Thank you very much and back to you. Thanks, Francisco. Uh, Francesca, and just for clarification, it's uh, selective only for those, uh, for the purposes to make sure that if the quality assurance body doesn't have in its mandate a review of cross-border provisions, then it doesn't refer to them. But if in the mandate they do review, they do quality assurance uh, across, across the border, or they do the uh, uh, quality assurance of the cross-border higher education, that is mandatory for them. We used to have it as part of GGP. One standard in the GGP was on a transnational education, but then we found that it was not um, many organizations that would apply for external review. They would say that it's um, we, we do not do it. It's not in our mandate. So we would exempt them from that DGP. But now this resolves this problem. Yes. Yeah. Can I reply, Susanna? Because yeah, yeah. maybe I phrased it in a, in an incorrect way. What I meant is what I meant to say is that you know any uh, national agency. So leaving aside. Yeah, yeah. The private providers, any national agency should have now, particularly after the COVID, the mandate of caring about transnational provision. And that's why I meant that this model should be mandatory. Sorry. Absolutely. In, absolutely, uh, absolutely agree with you. Absolutely agree with you. Back to Jamil uh, to have his, um, you know, reflections on this item and also closing remarks because he needs to run to Chia and present over there too, <laughs> to Chia conference. Thank you very much, Susanna. Maybe three three elements that really caught my attention. First of all, I'm sorry to have to leave because it's such a rich and stimulating conversation. There are now we have several questions that I would I'm dying to answer, but there is no time for that. But three uh, last comments before I leave. Um, one of the questions is about the challenge of guessing the competencies that you want to give to your students when we don't know what jobs are coming tomorrow, 
right? And I think that's why several of you, my uh, distinguished colleagues have mentioned lifelong learning uh, as a critical dimension that needs uh, perhaps more emphasis. We have the digital transition, we have now the green transition, and the, the work, world of work is going to change drastically. So uh, we need to, to think through, you know, these flexible mechanisms so that in a world of continuous learning, how we incorporate that first in the programs that uh, uh, higher education institutions impart, and then in the quality assurance and recognition elements of that. That's the first part. The second, I think, is the thinking about the sequence. We have at the global level and regional level, we have the work done by UNESCO in terms of recognition. We have this excellent work initiated by INQUAI in terms of standards and guidelines. And then this goes to the national quality assurance agencies, though in some cases we have regional one. And then we shouldn't forget the last but perhaps even more important dimension of what's happening in the high education institutions themselves. Um, this, and in terms of their internal quality assurance, not only units, but culture that should be uh, embedding the entire institution. And that leads me to the third point. I think we need to visualize a triangle. First, we have these standards, the recognition standards, the, the role of the quality assurance and national qualifications framework. Then we have this element of trust that you mentioned, Susanna, which is so important because it's not only about trying to enforce uh, these, uh, these standards, and uh, but it's really having this mutual trust in high education institutions towards the quality assurance uh, agencies not to be perceived as enforcers, as punishers, but as Francisco rightly said, it's all about enhancement. And then the third element of the triangle, the third uh, corner is the capacity, capacity of institutions that in many countries are still weak, are still uh, building themselves. So these three elements, standards and guidelines, recognition, then we have trust, and then we have uh, technical capacity. Um, thank you for bringing me on this panel and wishing you uh, another great half an hour. And uh, I'll see some of you in the Andre Chia conference later this morning. Thank it's you, us and... who should be thanking you. And it has been an honor to have you with us. And we wish you good luck with Chia as well. We will be joining you later on <laughs> at the Chia conference. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Thanks everyone. So Bye. Yeah. Bye. Now, building on what Jamil said and talking about the micro credentials and um, you know the commercialization of micro credentials and how, uh, uh, like Francisc mentioned here, here are the standards also. So um, the the we developed them to also ensure that um, the trust and credibility. Um, of those provisions are in place, but also uh, these standards and guidelines are promoting the. The, the core of the uh, changes that uh, we have been promoting in, and this is the flexible learning pathways. So this is uh, one of the core elements is the micro-credentials that we, we need to, um, uh, and recognition of diverse um, qualifications. So Francis, um, what would be your reflection about the um, uh, micro-credentials and you know, um, uh, the support of micro credentials um, in terms of the IHGs and promoting the uh, flexible learning pathways. Well, micro credentials are a moving target, so to say. <laughs> we, I think it's uh, it had been over the past maybe two years the talk of the day. I don't know any university rector or president that is not able to sleep uh, the reference to micro credentials either as a, as an opportunity or as a challenge. Um, worldwide. So, so I think that uh, we are all caught by the discourse, but not so many universities, I mean, with many exceptions, certainly, but not so many universities have been able really to develop their own uh, provision in that respect. So I think it's time for now um, for organizations like yours and ours uh, to reflect, first of all, on uh, whether we can frame the concept of micro-credentials. Uh, that's the first thing 
because uh, unless we really agree or reach a consensus of what micro credentials are, and particularly when it comes to the public provision, uh, once again, of micro credentials, then there is nothing that we could do. I mean, I have seen universities where their offerings are as low as equivalent to five hours, you know, and others uh, which claim that as a matter of fact, um, you know, their offerings represent the equivalent to one ECTS or even more. So, you know, it is a, a complex, a complex phenomenon. Now, I think that the role that the standards uh, plan to play in that respect, once again, is, is going to be uh, setting the direction for future developments. And I think that this is extremely important. Now, we need to supplement these, I would say, um, recommendations with a better knowledge of, um, I would say, uh, yes, of who is doing what and uh, with what impact, so to say. This is really um, um, a major uh, challenge for, for UNESCO. We are now starting and hope to complete by the end of 2023 a major mapping out exercise of who is doing what in that respect. They're not simply covering, uh, you know, um, in which subject areas universities, for instance, are more active in comparison to uh, transnational providers or even local providers, because we have a number of uh, local providers increasingly. Uh, but also, you know, we need to know really if the claims about the um, relevance and the quality of micro-credentials are really supported by the experience of end users. We need to, you know, unveil satisfaction uh, studies. We need also to see uh, what has been the impact of uh, micro-credentials in the uh, professional career of, of individuals, whether they respond or not uh, to, these, um, to their needs. I think that this is because we may discover that the whole talk about micro credentials corresponds only to the interest of a few <laughs> companies and it and not just a few areas of interest, which are really critical for knowledge economies or for economies based on technological developments, but might not be necessarily a recipe for, for everyone. So that's the first thing. Second thing we need to really uh, make an effort in terms of capacity development. I think that ideally, that's what UNESCO would like to do, and certainly I'm offering that to, to Inquahe. Uh, we need to at least be able to provide a micro-credential on micro-credentials, so to say, as to make sure that the consensus that we may have reached really pervades you know, the conversation. So when we talk about micro-credential, irrespective of where we are based, that we are really seeing the same thing. Okay, that's that's uh, really important. But certainly, we need to make a huge effort in terms of capacity development. We need universities, in particular, to understand the difference between just disaggregating existing academic programs into small pieces from a real micro credential, which is a, an immediate response to a rapid or an emergency need, particularly in the areas of maybe technology, finance, and, and others, okay? So that's the second aspect. And finally, the third one, and again, I would like to offer this to Inquahe, is that we need to sit with uh, regulators, uh, you know, and external and national quality uh, providers, because there is a big question mark about how far we should go when regulating the quality of micro credentials. I mean, my impression is that certainly we need to sit and discuss, but there is a risk for us also to, um, in a way, stop any innovation efforts. And I think that precisely the world, uh, the dynamic world of uh, our economies today need probably more room for, for innovation. So please, let's sit down and see what is feasible and at the, what is convenient, but, but at the same time, let's keep an open space for innovation. Otherwise, you know, uh, universities may not be able to do it, then others will do it, okay? So we, we need to see it. And once again, uh, I would like to extend my invitation to Inquahe just to make sure that uh, we engage in such a global conversation, so much needed. Thank you very much. And back to you, Susanna. Susanna, and if, if, yeah, yeah, Francisco. I, can, I yeah. just want to add a a word about it because I think, uh, you know, the, as Francesca indicated, 
you know, what, what is the limit between the regulation and the innovation uh, uh, of, uh, of this uh, very dynamic subject? You know, micro, somebody told me one day that micro credentials can lead to macro frustration and, uh, and micro frustration among everybody. Most, first of all, the students. If they have the expectation that the micro credential will lead to something magic, um, they, of course, the institutions, because in a way, let's recognize it. You know, uh, micro credentials in a way disrupt the traditional business model of the higher education institutions. And third, and more important, also the employers. You know, a micro credential may mean something or not. You know, there is a lot to do with that, but I think. The, the, at the end of the day, micro-credential is just a, an instrument of something that is much more relevant, which is the need for flexible higher education offerings in our, in our domains. That's what matters at the end of the day. Is that a micro-credential? Is that something else? No matter what, but I think it is important not to lose the sight of the, what is the purpose of this. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you, Francisco, that that's that, Michael, we have to avoid the macro frustrations, which are currently also growing now. I like the term you, you nailed it here. So um, uh, that is why uh, when we were developing the, the standards, we, um, uh, we made sure that um, uh, the the core of the micro credential and the, the we, we, these are short learning programs, uh, we are naming it and how they could be actually sub supporting the flexible learning pathways, the inclusiveness into education. In the meantime, keeping the trust and credibility as the core of all uh, all the actions. But but I agree with you uh, when it comes to commercialization. And um, we recently did a study with UNESCO and we have just completed it in Asia Pacific, the use cases of micro-credentials. And I agree with both of you, with Francisco and Francisco, the core of the problem is in the definition. It's it's although there is a definition from UNESCO there, but the way they, they, this definition is applied actually could cause a problem or could resolve the problem. But um, uh, yes, um, the the core of the problem in this in the region was to define, identify, and define the micro credentials. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a lot of work to be done, a lot of capacity building to be done, and we are happy here from Inguahi to join efforts with all of you, with the key experts, with UNESCO, to to support the development in this field. Um, one of the items uh, we have, like I'm. Uh, I'm well well aware of the time, and um, we have one of the items to be covered: the online education, and most importantly, the the module on the uh, on the guidelines for um, uh, enhancement of the higher, of the quality assurance providers. But in terms of online education, again, this we proposed as a selective module uh, due to the fact that um, not many organ not many quality assurance providers might be conducting a review of an online provision. Um, that is why this, this goes under the selective um, and if the, if the quality assurance provider identifies itself as a reviewer of an online provision, then this module applies to them on mandatory basis. So back to um, you, Deborah, to, to hear more about this online provision and what do you think about the, the uses of the standards and the benefits? So um, time check, Susanna, do you want me to keep my comments very brief? Or... Yeah, very brief. Yeah, because, uh, well, we, we, we also need to take some of the questions. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Um, well, I, I do want to go back to my point about interoperability, which I raised at a high level before. And I think um, to speak to that at a more granular level, both with regard to online provisions and um, short learning programs. The fact is that there is massive diversification in all different types of learning opportunities in tertiary education and across informal learning, learning on the job, et cetera. And as an example, Credential Engines research shows that there are over a million credentials offered just in the United States. And approximately 430,000 of those are micro-credentials. So no one can make sense of all of this complex landscape on their own. 
we need to have collaborative efforts to have transparency about what's inside all of those different credentials. So for example, with online programs, there needs to be explicit information about the modality and how it's offered and what supports there are for the online education. For short learning programs, how short, how much do they cost? What are the outcomes of those programs? What skills do they represent? And so to use schemas to represent all of those different types of learning opportunities all around the world can help us not only shed light on this vast landscape, um, but also be able to connect AI and how that, how AI can basically, you know, dissect some of this information, but make it structured information so that we can use it in ways that are reliable and trustworthy. So what do these what do these different types of credentials and learning programs mean? And how can we make that meaning transparent? And how can then we, through a variety of different types of quality assurance processes, be speaking a shared language about how we're evaluating um, the, the meaning and value of these different types of programs? Thanks a lot, Deb. Uh, and, um... Last but not least section here is the on, on the IHGs before we, we get into the questions um, that we have a couple of questions to respond, although some of them relate to um, enhancement, which we have already uh, tackled. And uh, I will be just uh, uh, quoting some of the key questions which we haven't covered so far. But before moving on to the questions, I would like to direct the, the final question to um, Esther and Francisco and uh, everybody to the whole panel, which relates to the quality enhancement continuum, the, the guidelines that we're providing. And uh, to start with, I would like to address my question to Esther uh, as an organization that has been through an external review for about four cycles. Um, uh, how can the IHG add value to the cyclical approach that you have? If you could briefly describe that matter to us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Susanna. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that when an organization repeatedly undergoes the same external qualifications procedure, it appears what is known as a review fatigue and has potential, potentially less impact. So the return is, is diminished. Furthermore, there is a risk of becoming a bureaucratic exercise. Mature qualifications providers ask for external review that goes beyond the threshold is standards and focusing more on enhancement. So this means that this will provide a stronger added value for the organization. So if we focus on the ISG, we can observe two particularities that can be considered more attractive to politicians providers. The first one is the inclusion of the three modules in addition to, to the baseline standards, which allows to offer an external re review, more focus on specific activities. The second is the quality enhancement continuum, which I personally found very interesting innovation. It is designed to meet different maturity levels of quality assurance providers and warranties. The review procedures um, will add value to the, to the quality assurance providers. The guiding principles enables the growth of uh, quality assurance providers. It's round and impacts at the system level too. So this aspirational model contributes to the continuous enhancement of uh, the providers from different perspectives. So in my opinion, the ISG combines perfectly well the accountability and the enhancement roles of an external review process. The three different steps defining the quality enhancement focus will have a positive impact on qualifications providers and the tertiary education system. So it is important also to add that the evolution of quality assurance providers should be done progressively and should avoid tension. And finally, and very briefly, I found very, my personal view is that I found very interesting the, the guiding principle linked to transformation, which introduces uh, the trans transformative capacity of the external quality assurance procedures on the um, tertiary education system and, and if we go more deeply on, on the rubric rubrics includes very interesting ideas as for example the capacity to alter the culture of the tertiary education institutions and system or the leadership of the quality assurance provider 
in the quality assurance arena. So that's very interesting. And we can connect those ideas with the challenges that has been previously set. Over to you, Susanna, very quickly. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot, Esther. Indeed, uh, quality culture has been a phantom of the opera for all of us. We all talk about it. Nobody sees it. Nobody can judge it. And yeah, uh, definitely um, the transformative power. This is something that would actually enable us to see how things are going. And especially when this transformative as, um, impact goes on to the higher education level and the learning of the students and the, 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 the deliver of the faculty. So these are all the cores that matter. With this, um, uh, Francisco, Francesc, Deborah, any final reflections on the IHGs, and then we, we move on to the questions? There, there is just one comment that I like to make, uh, and I think it is, what I like to do is to challenge all the participants in this session as, as being the sort of the betters of the, uh, of the movement of quality assurance. In fact, I will challenge Inquahe to even to change its name. Shouldn't be called Inquahe anymore should be related to quality improvement rather than quality assurance. So I think we need to get over this idea that agencies of quality are the ones which are there to, in a way, maintain the status quo. Uh, I think it should be a much more proactive approach to the improvement of the quality rather than the assurance of the quality. I think uh, our educational systems in the world of higher education in recent years have properly transition from this idea of quality control, quality verification, uh, to later quality assurance, which I think it has been great. But now I think we are ready to go beyond that and we need to really challenge our assumptions and then go over the quality improvement culture. Otherwise, we are gonna be just maintaining the status quo. And I think the ISGs provides a very good basis for that because it's a very dynamic concept is not a static concept, but of course that requires a significant mindset change of the ones which are sort of in, in charge of those organizations. So that's why, again, I'm very pleased that uh, we have those individuals participating at this session. And I hope that um, some of you might take that challenge as, a, as something that really needs to transition the movement towards the next stage. Otherwise, all of us are going to become features of the past, not of the future. I, I couldn't have framed it better than you. So thank you very much for this very nice, you know, conclusive remark on this, um, uh, the need of quality assurance and challenging all of us in terms of enhancement. Enhancement, enhancement and capacity building. This is all that matters and this is all that will be moving things forward. Um, Deb, uh, Francesc, I, I just wanted to um, echo that in English, there's a saying, quality is everyone's job. And I encourage us all to think about um, quality assurance and high quality information as um, cultural changes that go well, well beyond um, quality assurance providers. How can we reach out to other organizations to um, other bodies of work and make a quality culture part of many different changes that are happening as learning opportunities expand exponentially. Thanks, Deb. Francesc? Yes, uh, just a couple of things. One is I couldn't agree more with what uh, Francisco and Deborah have already said. Um, and I would like to add to that uh, just another, another element. I mean, um, your network is really impressive, but I think that when it comes to um, a successful approach to these uh, quality uh, improvement um, as, a, as, a, as a global mandate, I think that we need to work together. So I would certainly would like to con consider ways in which we can cooperate, not necessarily UNESCO only, but other um, um, members of the UN family to make sure that whatever you see from a technical perspective from, from the trenches, so to say, is really backed by soft regulations supported by international organizations. And uh, let me finalize by saying that today, 
uh, we are commemorating at the United Nations the International Education Day, the International <laughs> Day of Education, the 24th of January. So uh, this is really wonderful that this is happening because usually when the, in the United System, uh, in the United Nations system, we talk about education, we have tended to forget higher education. And it's really, uh, you know, um, already an indication that this uh, international agenda in education is increasingly considering higher education as part of the of uh, of the mandate i mean it's really a uh, very very good news so thank you very much for that and unfortunately precisely because today is the international day of education i need to move to another event i'm so sorry so i will remain here still some for some minutes but then i, I need to move to the next one sorry and thank you to all and thanks thanks everybody and uh, I would like to also congratulate everybody on the occasion of the International Day of Education. So uh, congratulations to all of us. Let's take one uh, question at least at this point, and then we would be uh, responding to all of the questions that have been here um, in uh, direct messaging uh, through the email. Um, uh, like uh, the, the final one about the micro-credentials seems to be partly driven by a demand that employers and industries need for upskilling and reskilling. How can higher education institutions keep abreast of such pressing demands? Further, employed and unemployed persons are seeing the value of these micro credentials to retain or gain employment. So, um, anybody wants to respond to this comment? Well, I, I, I would be glad to to make some comments about it. It's I, you know, that's that's one of the challenges that I find in 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 conventions about credentials. Because at the end of the day, what the credential is capturing is this assumption that I do have a set of skills that are the ones that the convention, the term is that are the right skills for an individual which is in a particular profession. But when we talk about the needs of the future, and in fact, I might say the needs of the present, well, many times we know that it is not necessarily about the accumulation of knowledge, but it's much more about those skills that are going to be the ones determining the success of an individual into the labor market and into, and into the society. And we like it or not, many times in our higher education institutions and systems, we don't have the capacity to really measure those. You know, we talk about many of the uh, so-called employability skills, and then we assume that in our higher education institutions learn those skills by osmosis. We don't have, you know, courses related to critical thinking or to whatever many other elements that are, in theory, ideal for uh, the success of those individuals in the needs of future society. So, in consequence, I think we need to rethink many of the ways that we are trying to capture those elements into, again, what is the main purpose of the idea of recognition, the quality of those individuals. Again, I have no solution, but I just want to add my voice to this frustration of trying to measure something that is not probably relevant anymore in trying to force, if you want, the realities of the future into that particular past that no longer is needed and or is no longer existing. Thanks, Francisco. Deb? Um, I think it's clear that skills-based learning and skills-based hiring and advancement are the wave of the future. It's absolutely necessary because what people need to know and be able to do is changing so rapidly. And so um, we don't need to completely rethink our tertiary education systems or our you know, ways of providing education and training in general completely, but we do need transparency about what, not just skills are inside those credentials, but knowledge, skills, and abilities and how they've been assessed at different levels. We know how to do this, we're educators, but we do not do it transparently. So um, again, you know, we need interoperable schema, we need ways of actually illuminating those skills inside these programs so that people can mix and match and have stackable short learning programs and reuse skills from one credential um, to apply to another credential or another career. It, there's really just no way around it. We have to be able to do that. 
Thanks, Deb. Frances? Yes, I would like to uh, stress the fact that um, um, following the third World um, Conference of Higher Education uh, last year, uh, UNESCO has launched a roadmap for the uh, transformation of higher education, which is now open for comments. So I'd like to invite all participants to read it and make their, their own comments. And I think that the roadmap in itself reminds us of many contradictions that the provision of higher education contains. One is that on the one hand, we are calling for more flexibility. I'm talking about what the roadmap reads, you know, so mm -hmm. a call for flexibility where you can find certainly room for micro credentials. And I would say more emphasis on the skills, for instance, on the skills provision. But on the other hand, the roadmap also would like to remind in particular governments and higher education institutions that there is a risk of learnification to put too much emphasis on just the development of skills, forgetting that higher education should be, at least for the younger generations, a transformational experience where learning is just a vehicle for a personal maturation process and a process in which you become really um, um, empowered as a citizen, as a member of a culture, as a, as a political actor, if you wish, as well, right? Without having necessarily um, value in the market? Not really. I mean, that we need both things and this may sound contradictory, but I would like to alert about the risk of putting too much emphasis on skills development, forgetting the most, uh, I would say, ambitious mission that higher education should have, which is the transformation of people's lives and by doing on that on individuals and groups, our societies and economies as well. Thank you. Balance is the right word. So just just uh, capitalizing on your the, on the roadmap that you mentioned, I would request Bia to uh, share the slide on our conference, which we're holding in Kazakhstan, Astana. And it's uh, in line with the roadmap for UNESCO. Uh, Ingwahi is proposing a roadmap for 2030 for quality assurance providers. And we're inviting everybody for this discussion. But uh, before, um, uh, Esther, I saw your hand. I, yeah. uh, please, please say your reflections before I go yeah. into the conference. <laughs> yeah, very, very briefly. Just from the quality assurance point of view, we we have to be innovative uh, in our procedures in order to embrace all all those challenges and have very easy processes in in, in order not to overburden uh, institutions, etc. Just to add this idea. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And Bia, if you could share the slide. Um, there are a lot of questions here, very interesting questions, and we will be responding to you via email. And also we're inviting you to this conference, uh, which will be held in Kazakhstan, Astana, hosted by uh, our gracious host, uh, e e e EQAA. Um, and I saw Sholpan right now. She was uh, talking here with us and they are here. So uh, the the conference is actually is in response to the World Higher Education Conference um, uh, that UNESCO came up with in, 20, uh, in 2022 in May in Barcelona, where they presented the roadmap, which is now open for discussion. And we are introducing the roadmap to enabling quality in tertiary education 2030 in response to the roadmap of UNESCO. And you see that the four themes that are evolving around this are uh, fostering quality of flexible learning pathways, digitalization of in teaching and learning without compromising quality, quality issues of cross-border education and the core values. So the, the more, more is to come, stay tuned, and we look forward to welcoming you in our conference in Astana. I would like to thank with this our gracious panel, the, the honorable guests that made this panel really very lively and very successful. I feel like there has been a very lively discussion here and we will be continuing doing this. Most importantly, we will continue joining our efforts to uh, advance all these, uh, you know, um, good ideas that we have raised over here and the, the good intentions that are coming, um, the, the constructive intentions that are coming in the roadmap and the, the um, proposals coming from the quality assurance uh, community as well. Thank you, everybody. And we wish you the best of all. And we look forward to more. Stay tuned to more as well. Thank you a lot.